Tonight, I have labeled my message, Grace. This is amazing grace. Many people don't understand the word grace. Anybody want to try to explain to me the word grace? Unmerited favor. Somebody else. Christ's riches at God's riches at Christ's expense. I love that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. God's riches at Christ's expense. Thank you, Carolyn. We don't fully understand the word grace or gracia. Did I say that right? Gracias. No, gracias is thank you. But gracia is in Greek, I believe, right? Gracia. There's grace. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, and let's read what this, is, what this says. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and is not from yourself. This is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. Salvation is this free, uh, free gift, this grace, and grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Somebody write that down because that's good. Write this down quickly. Absolutely. It's free for us, but it costs everything to our Jesus. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's good. Wow. It just came to you? That's, that's perfect. I merit this favor, but I like God's riches at Christ's expense. It costs us nothing. We accept salvation by faith, but yet it costs everything to God, to Jesus. And as we look at salvation, as we look at grace, this is amazing grace. Let's go to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives at the, in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are very his own, eager to do what is good. Do I have anybody in the house that is eager to do something good? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for these people. Now, as we look at this grace that, that brings salvation to all people, I don't know if you read this, if you got this, but in verse number 12, it says that this grace does something. Let's read this again. It teaches. I don't know about you, but I don't always like to be taught. Sometimes I want to be the teacher without being taught. Amen? <laughs> And, and we see this world, if you look out in the world, we see that as we talk to unbelievers, they want to teach us not knowing what the Bible says. They want to teach us what they think the Bible says. But the, the Bible is clear that this grace, it teaches us to say no. The, this word no is very difficult for me. Anybody have a difficult uh, time saying no? I'm not talking about two sinful things. I'm just saying in general, does anybody have a problem saying no? Amen, see? That's half of us. We have a problem with saying no. And this grace teaches us the word no. And not only no, but no to ungodliness and worldly passions 
to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life in this present age. The word no is very difficult to say, especially when your children give you those beautiful puppy eyes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We have two cats in the house, as all of you know already. They've made at least half of my sermons already. And many times they come and they, well, they're fooling around and they broke something the other day. They jumped on the, on the windowsill and uh, my wife's flowers went crashing. It was one of her favorite, um, what do you call that uh, flower, honey? I know orchid, but there was a special name you gave me. The one that was in the windowsill that fell from the blue. It smells like coconut, but what is it called? You Let it go. Okay. It was a difficult name, but it was, uh, anyways. It smells like coconut and the, uh, one of the cats, because they were both there, and I hear this, this plant crashing. Uh, I, run o- I run over there, and the, they're both looking at me like, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. How do you say no to something like that? But this grace, this salvation, this unmerited favor, this God's riches at Christ's expense, I almost memorized that, is teaching us tonight to say no. No matter how good, how flavorful, how aromatic the sin may be, this grace is teaching us to say no. Grace. This is amazing grace. Self-control, as I've told, told you, is something that I've been working on. And I've been really putting it into practice in this earthly body of mine. Can I tell you how difficult it is? Anybody like sugar? Bread? Sweets, I get, keep, keep your hands up. Once I, sugar, let me try it one more time. Sugar, bread, sweets. Rihanna, keep your hand up. <laughs> French fries, <laughs> rice, rice and beans, pork fried rice. <laughs> and this, <laughs> all of the above. And this grace is teaching me How to say no. How to live in self-control. Can I tell you it's difficult? As of tonight, I'm 29 pounds lighter. Do I? Good. Thank God. We're We're on a journey. But this self-control has to start in this body. And it, <laughs> on Sunday, when, uh, after church service, when we went to Ant's vacation house, and as we were talking to, uh, you know, the, the downstairs uh, under that um, porch, we had all the young couples and uh, Daniel and Millie, and uh, he was talking about how he grew up in a, strict Pentecostal uh, household. And he said, the only sin we were able to do is eat as much as we want. That was one sin that was available to us. And he said, we did it well. We did it well. (laughs) But this self-control, we must learn to first discipline this body. And this grace, this saving grace, helps us do that. Once we figure out how to control our own selves, then we will have the mastery to tell someone else about Jesus as well. Again, I'm not saying that we all should go on a diet, 
But each one of us has a weakness. Somebody say weakness. And the devil is good at taking this little weakness and tugging on it. All the things that I told you earlier, sugar, bread, french fries, pork fried rice, rice in general. That's my weakness. I love good food, especially if it tastes good. Have you had my wife's food? All of you have, I know. William raised two hands. And because it is so good, I must exercise self-control. This grace, let's read this verse number 12 one more time. This grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Again, I spoke about self-control, but there are other things, ungodliness. Worldly passions, upright and godly lives is what, the, what is opposite of those things. And it is possible by grace, this amazing grace. John 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Uh, among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, Jesus came in flesh. Couldn't God just speak to us from above like he spoke to Jesus? He could have. But, see, Jesus this, uh, was obedient to the Father and took on flesh. Why would Jesus have to take on flesh? To be like us. So we don't have any excuse. We literally have no, no excuse. Because the word, Jesus, came in flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And not only did he make his dwelling amongst us, but he was full of glory. We have seen the glory of God in his one and only son. Amen? We have seen God's glory presented to us on a platter, if I may say that. Presented to this fallen humanity. This is God in flesh. Verse 15. John John the Baptist testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I, I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we, uh, we, have our, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Did you get that ready? Listen to me one more time. Out of his fullness, out of God's fullness, out of Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. So we already had grace. God is so gracious. God was gracious to his people. He gave them the law. So there was grace already given. Amen? I mean, I'm understanding this. There was grace already given, but in the place of that grace, God gave his own son himself as grace. This is amazing grace. I don't know if you get this, but this is amazing grace. For the law, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. How many know that grace and truth are opposite? Grace and truth are not the same. They're opposite because grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. I merit the favor. Truth is we are sinners. 
Anybody with me? The truth is we are sinners, but yet we, through grace, through Jesus, through God's, God's riches uh, <laughs> at Christ's expense, we, the, the debt that we should have paid, we never could pay back because we all sin. Has anybody sinned today? You can raise your hand or lie, as one of the pastors said. You can raise your hand or lie. <laughs> I, I, once I heard that, I'm going to use that. You can raise your hand or lie. Add another sin to your day. But this grace that was given, uh, that came through Jesus, cancels out all Dead. Somebody say it cancels out all dead. Because John 3 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I don't know if you understand it this fully, but this grace, this amazing grace, Jesus came not to condemn you, but to save you. And I'm sorry if I'm pointing to anybody in particular. I'm not trying to. I'm just trying to go from one direction to another direction, not to offend anybody. Let the gospel do that. Amen? The gospel is offensive as it is. As it is. I don't need to be any more offensive. You can wear a mask. You cannot wear a mask. I don't care. But I'm going to hit you with the, with the truth. Jesus came into this world that everyone who believes in him shall be saved. And this is the grace that we have received. The good news is that God's grace is that every sinner is not beyond the reach of God's grace. Every sinner has an opportunity to receive. Somebody say receive. The Apostle Paul was a persecutor of the church and therefore he considered himself the worst of all however even this worst person in the world received grace see apostle paul never met me he would have said that's the worst sinner but even i received grace first timothy 1 13 through 15 even though i was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man i was shown mercy because i acted in ignorance and unbelief the grace of our lord was poured out on me abundantly some would say abundantly along with faith and love that are in christ jesus here is a trust, trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to, have, to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Say with me. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst or chief. And this applies to every single individual that's sitting in this room. Those that have been saved by grace. Apostle Paul understood this and he said guys listen can I tell you my testimony my testimony is this I was a blasphemer but this amazing grace saved me and this amazing grace put me on the righteous path this amazing grace was poured out in verse 14 the grace of our Lord poured out on me abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And this is the amazing grace that we're talking about tonight. See, you see, Jesus was not interested in the self-righteous. Jesus says, I, in Luke 5, 32, says, I have not come to call the righteous. If you feel like you're righteous, this message is not for you. You can shut the, shut the TV off, shut the computer off, shut your phone off. If you feel like you're righteous already, this message is not for you. But Jesus says, I have not come for you. I have come to call the, not the, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God's grace trains us. 
Titus 2, verses 12 to 14. It says it. Let's read this one more time. It teaches us to say no. Somebody say no. No to ungodliness. No to worldly passions. No to life in... Oh, sorry, and, uh, saying yes to, to life so, uh, is self-controlled, upright and godly lives at this present age. Anyone have children? Have you ever trained your children to say no? Let's try this. Let me ask my son. This is, not, this is unplanned. Sit there. Do you go with strangers? Say louder. No. See, answer is no. As we teach our children, so, so this grace teaches us. Grace trains us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must say no to themselves. See, read this. Read this with me. The word deny means no. Whoever wants to be my disciples must say no to themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. To deny yourself. This is the grace that teaches us to say no to our desires. See, I, I've been learning for the past two months, I've been learning to say no to sugar. How many know that sugar is more addictive than cocaine? That's what they say. I'm telling you, uh, I hope hopefully uh, the couple that brought the cake to my house on the on the first week the, of uh, me detoxing from sugar is watching this. You all know them and love them. I like picking on them just because I can. And plus, they're not here to defend themselves. But I had to learn to say no to sugar. I love cake. I still love cake. The other day, when uh, on Sunday, when we were uh, having a baptism for Rihanna, Mrs. Ann Lavoy called me ahead of time and said, Pastor, how do you feel about having cake? I said, everybody can have the cake. I might have a sliver. See, I tried sneaking that in. But do you know that you could have good food that tastes just as good without the sugar? And would you share the recipe with the rest of them so they can make me that cake once in a while? <laughs> no. It was all gone by the time <laughs> I had a little sliver. It was made out of healthy food without any sugar see we we uh, many times people say well you christians are boring the same way i thought that life without sugar is no fun <laughs> listen to me please, please uh, just please uh, i'm trying to make a point here god's been teaching me something so i'm trying to uh, pass this on this knowledge on to some of you i felt that there is no life without sugar to me, sugar was the drug of choice, if you may say that. And many of us sin, whatever form it may be, is the drug of choice. And we hear from our loved ones, those that don't know Jesus, we hear from them that say, Christianity is boring. How can you have fun if there is no X, Y, Z and you put in the sin that so easily entangles us how can you have fun if you don't have whatever the sin may be see i'm i am living proof that you can have fun without sugar i'm i'm a living proof that you can have fun without sin i am the living proof i'm standing in front of you and i feel better for it at least i've been told i feel better All of you know that I've been, I've always been active. So uh, these 29 pounds that, are, that I'm missing, I don't feel it. 
But Jesus says, if you want to be my disciples, you must say no to whatever the sin you so love. Pastor Josh Eldridge is the one that got me on this diet. And he's the one that kind of explained to my wife very quickly. Um, and then my wife did a lot of research on how it works. Again, I'm not, I'm not promoting a diet. I'm, ch- I'm just trying to show you through my diet biblical principles. Am I, am I getting my point across? Pastor Josh was 400 pounds. A large man. When he told me that he was 400 pounds, I did not believe him. He said, he told me that he, what he used to eat and what he loved to eat. I said, yeah, that sounds good. Because let me tell you that sin feels good for a season. Listen to me, people. See, uh, sin feels good for a season. If you sinned and you did not feel good about it, you sinned wrong. I'm telling you, you sinned wrong, but don't go back. It, it, the time is over. And when Pastor Josh told me that he was 400 pounds, I did not believe him. He showed me a picture. He says, this was me. I said, how is that possible? That's like W. And, and as I started following a diet, the same way that God puts us on this grace diet, Anybody with me? As I started following what is recommended, the sin started falling off. These, in my case, pounds, but in, you know, in biblical terms, sin that follows us starts falling off. Whoever wants to be my disciple must learn to say no to, their, to themselves, say no to their desires, and daily pick up their cross and follow me. Start reading. Good place to start. Really good place to start. First John 2.16. For everything in the world, sugar. That's what it says, right? Pork fried rice. Let's read about the Bible. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. All of these things that weigh us down, the sin that weighs us down is not from God. Your body is not made to sin. People, listen again. Your body is not made to process sin. The same way your body... starts reacting when you have too much sugar is the same way your body reacts when you have sin. You can have fun. You can have plenty of sweet things. Do you know that carrots have plenty of good sugar in them? And too much even of carrots is not good for you. Once you're trying to lose weight. Too much of a good thing may be too good, right? Right? But this grace, it trains us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. It's not, to, it's not enough to say no to ungodliness in this, and worldly desires. You must also say yes to self-control, righteousness, and godly living. And this grace, this amazing grace, trains us to live self in self with self control how do you show self control how do you show self control smaller portions good titus 1:8 rather he must be hospitable one who loves what is good who is self controlled upright holy and disciple a pastor this is talking about pastorship It doesn't apply to me. I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to be a leader in the church. Okay. Sure. You can say that. But it's a good place to start. Being hospitable is something that you could say it's a lost art in our modern world. Amen. 
being hospitable. And can I, I'm going to commend Living Waters now. Every single one of you who is here and who has helped us with the unity service that we had in the back about two months ago. Every single one of you, uh, give yourself a hand clap because you were hospitable. We had a couple of sisters who kept on bringing us water and water and water. We, we, we let it all out through our skin. And some of you showed up and helped and helped and helped. And some of you cooked and cooked and cooked. And some of you prayed and prayed and prayed. And some of you did all of those things. And can I tell you that so far, Living Waters has been the most hospitable church that we have made these events happen at. Yes, and this past Sunday was no exception when we went to Ann's um, vacation home. Praise God. Praise God. Again, when I'm, when I'm preaching these things, when I'm teaching these things, I'm talking about not only living waters, because there's people watching who are not part of, you know, our body on, a, a sun, on Sundays, who have not sat under the good uh, teaching of Pastor Earl or myself. There's people who are coming in fresh, so we need to talk about these things. Amen? But hospital, hus, hospitality is something that is ingrained into living waters. One who loves what is good. See, the Bible says there comes a day, and the, the, we're living in that day, when good will be called evil, and evil will be called good. But the Bible says, if you want to be a Christian, you must be hospitable, you must love what is good. And how do we know what is good? Where's the standard? Let's open up. Let's read. Amen? Let's read what the God says. Let's not try to spin sin around. Let's see what it says. Who is self-controlled? Again, we... we Throughout the Bible, the self-control issue just comes up. Upright, holy, disciplined. And if we can't discipline ourselves, somebody else will. Titus 2, first eight, eight, first eight verses. You, however, must teach what, what is appropriate to sound doctrine. This... this uh, this passage is for me because I must teach what is appropriate to the right doctrine, to the sound doctrine. But this is also appropriate for you because what I teach, you take and you pass on to others. On Monday, Kathy came in with her daughter and her daughter was asking questions because Kathy took what I was teaching and presented it to her daughter. Right? Yeah. And her daughter wasn't sure she was telling that Kathy was telling her the right way. She said, Pastor, could you explain this to me? I said, Absolutely. She said, That's what my daughter that's what my mother said, but I didn't believe her. She listens. She applies what we teach here. And this goes out to everyone else. This is just a you know, I'm giving examples that just happen, you know, right away. So if I missed an opportunity to pick on you. I apologize. I'll pick on you next time. Verse 2. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love and endurance. Let's stop right there for a few seconds. See, this grace teaches us to say no, but at the same time, this grace teaches us to be temperate. Anybody who wants to give me another word or a similar word for temperate? temperate? Hmm? Moderate. Worthy of respect. Men, we must carry ourselves with authority 
for the men that are here and the men watching online, we must carry ourselves with authority and we don't have to, so that we don't have to ask for respect, but we act worthy of respect. Amen? Self-controlled. I think I beat the self-controlled word into submission here. Anybody understand the word self-control tonight? Absolutely. Sound in faith. What, what, what do you think sound in faith means? That whatever the storms that hit you, you're not shaking about. You are standing Remember our vision for 2020? If having done all to stand, it's time to stand. This soundness of faith is showing the, that w- what you have been teaching, you are living. And I hope that all of you um, can verify that the things that I teach from the pulpit, I live. Amen? If, if I ever teach something and I live a different way, call me out right from, right from where you're sitting. And say, Pastor, last week you, talked, you were talking about standing in faith and you were not standing in faith. Go ahead and call me out. I, I ask you because I need to be accountable not to just um, the elder board or to the assemblies of God, but I need to be accountable to the church as well. Amen? And there if we, if we keep each other accountable, we can say that we are standing in faith. In love and in endurance. Endurance literally means having done all to stand. Stand therefore. Verse 3. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, uh, and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and subject to their husbands, so that none, so that no one will malign the word of God. See, women get more verses than men. I had to break this down. Teach the older women to be reverent. The way they live. Somebody help me, please. The word reverent. What can you, what do you think about when you think about the word reverent or reverence? Godly. Think about the way you live. Think about the words you speak. Amen? The Bible teaches us that we should care the things that we say, the things that we if, uh, uh, if Apostle Paul was living out things that we post online, things that we tell others, we must be reverent. Somebody say reverent. Not to be slanderers. Slanderers are the ones that take some information here, mix it up, and tell that information there. Somebody want to what I'm, know what I'm talking about? Gossipers. <laughs> Men are just as guilty of these things as women. Not addicted to much wine. Better yet, don't drink. But to teach what is good. Somebody say good. And where do we get the standard again? The word of God. Then they can urge the younger women. See, the older women, you older women, I don't know who you are, but those older women, whoever he's he's talking about, I see a lot of young women in front of me. (laughs) But those, (laughs) those older women must teach the younger women to love their husbands and love their children. This doesn't apply so much to our church, although it may. I, at least I haven't heard us, but in a certain church that I am friends with, with a pastor, and I'm friends with lots of pastors, as you know, in their church, there was a, 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 an older woman who used to go to the younger ladies, oh my God, you just had a child. Oh my God, you must have no time to even take care of yourself. 
oh my God. And she made her, or made them, the younger women, feel like this husband of mine is taking advantage of me. Well, it too, takes two to tango, right? Takes two to tango, dance, tango. And this child, instead of being loved, now is looked upon as an anchor. Something that's not letting this young mother go to work or have fun or whatever else. You, you guys know and understand what I'm talking about, right? And we had this uh, a discussion uh, with the pastors, what, what, what should be done? How can, and I said, well, Titus chapter 2, it's really good to tell to read, you know. Can you look at t Titus chapter 2 when you get home? Again, uh, I'm not picking on anybody here because all of you are really good with this. Verse 5. We understand about loving husbands and children, amen? Yes? Do I have any older women in the house? Because I see all young, beautiful ladies in front of me. Verse 5. To be self-controlled, again, that self-controlled word comes up, and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. The word of malign, help me somebody, twist. So no one would twist the word of God. If we are under good teaching, if we are under submission to our husbands, if we are sub, uh, submitted to the pastor and the pastor is submitted to Christ, we, we will not have to twist the word of God. Because the word of God is pure. Amen. Verse 7. In, in, um, verse, sorry, verse 6. Similarly, encourage young men to be self-controlled. Young men. I'm looking at Jeremy, young men. Looking at William, young men. Looking at Demetrius, young men. Go ahead. Danny, young men. Go ahead. Oh, you're present. Young men. Looking at myself. Young men. Similarly, it encouraged the young men to be self-controlled. See, if we can control ourselves, we can control everything else. Because when we are self-controlled, we are being submissive to God. In everything, set them as an example by doing what is good. If, you, if you're teaching if your teaching uh, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Our time is running out, but I want to give you an example. Certain individuals were looking for a reason to say that I, your pastor, was, am teaching false information. And they combed through my sermons, because every, every, everything that I say is online. They have combed through my, uh, everything that I preach, and they were not able to find anything that does not align with the Word of God. And that not, not, I don't get the glory. God gets the glory, because I try to follow what this says in your teaching show integrity the word integrity listen to what it says and apply it amen seriousness i don't i don't try to say too many jokes from the pulpit because this is serious business amen sometimes i i joke around uh, gently because it is always good uh, for good medicine to go down with something sweet. Amen? Soundness of speech. I practice what I, uh, what I preach so that uh, that cannot be condemned. So those that oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. I'm going right to the end of my sermon. Rihanna. How does Amazing Grace 
work. How does amazing grace work? Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Again. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The grace of God works in everyone who lends an ear. Anybody with me? The grace of God has appeared. Jesus has appeared. Say it with me. Jesus has appeared. And he offers salvation to everyone. The Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the grace. This is the amazing grace that we are preaching. And this amazing grace teaches us to say no. This amazing grace, uh, say no to ungodliness, worldly passions. It's, it teaches us to say yes to live a self-controlled life. It's teaching us to say yes to an upright life. It's teaching us to say yes to a godly life even today. Even in the 21st century, in the year 2021, when all hell is breaking loose, this godliness is still appropriate for today. Somebody say it is appropriate for the present age for today. While we wait, this amazing grace, while we wait, helps us to live. Because we all believe that, God, that Jesus is about to break the, uh, the sky. That Jesus is about to come soon and very, very soon. And our great God and our Savior, our Jesus, who gave himself, verse 14, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify to himself a people that are his very own. These people, this is you and me. If you have given your life to Jesus, this is you and me to do what is good. This grace, this amazing grace teaches us to do what is good. The story of Jesus, his coming, his death, his burial, and his resurrection boils down to a single word that I have called tonight grace. God's riches. At Christ's expense. I'll try not to forget that. Can't make any promises, but I'll try. Say it with me. As we, let's all stand and let's say this. God's riches at Christ's expense. If you have not accepted God's riches at Christ's expense, tonight is a good night. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I can't do it on my own. Your word says, if all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Tonight, Lord, I surrender myself. I give you myself. You, you owe me. I am yours. From this day forth, I will live for your uh, glory, for your grace. Thank you, Jesus, for this grace, this God's riches at Christ's expense. Thank you for your unmerited favor. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.